So, does deconstruction speak more to a problem in our churches or our culture? We're going to be talking about deconstructing the faith tonight. Is the church to blame, or is there a new religion in our culture that may be driving this? All coming up here on the Very Relaxed Dude Facts Podcast. Welcome to the Dude Facts Podcast. We're four guys that are united by a love for coffee, Jesus, and corny jokes. In the past, we all served in ministry together. In the present, we create podcasts to help you get through your week. And in the future, we aspire to be the granddad that teaches his grandkids to pull his finger. So if you love Java, Jesus, and dad jokes, you're going to fit right in. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of joe, and enjoy this week's episode of the Dude Facts Podcast. Oh yeah, boys. We're just hanging out tonight. Dude Facts Podcast, sitting around the couch. We really just wanted to watch the World Series, and uh, we decided to use this setup so we could do that. And it's completely (laughs) going to be worth all the struggle. (laughs) <laughs> yes, absolutely. Even if it doesn't turn out right, at least you can see part of our heads watching the World Series. <laughs> Which is exactly all the, what you want. All this works. We can get a comment from Ethan and Tyler. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but you better comment, boys. So Ryan Ryan is the resident oh, Rangers yeah. fan. He's got the hat on. The hey, throwback. This is like the old like 1970s style. I, I love Texas it. Tea. And you know what's great is everybody that's listening to this podcast will be listening after the World Series is over. Yeah. But we are currently watching game number five. Yeah. It may or may not happening. be tonight, the end of the World Series. We, we just saw the first pitch, which I think was a ball, but the computer's in the way. I can't see. What's that, what's that guy's last name? <laughs> Simeon. <laughs> oh, Simeon. <laughs> So it is the, the way. Texas Rangers, games. which uh, did, did you go to a lot of Rangers oh, games yeah. in seminary, Josh? Went to a lot. I think you and I went to several. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you'd pay five bucks and sit in the high risers. And it of was course, the best thing. They were terrible then until they got A-Rod. Then yeah. they were kind of neat and yeah. relevant. Then he abandoned them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then one night, I, uh, I or actually one Sunday, I bought tickets and went with a friend of mine from seminary, and we showed up, and it just so happened to be uh, same-sex recognition oh, at the ballpark. So you went at the right night. And uh, yeah, uh, we we sat with space in between us, dude space, <laughs> but it was very interesting. Didn't want to be one of those unfortunate people that gets shown on like the yeah. jumbo screen. <laughs> yep, seminary students. <laughs> Yeah, my parents would have seen that and been like, well, you have something to tell us? <laughs> what kind of school no. did you go to? <laughs> but uh, the Rangers are playing the Diamondbacks. Yeah. And we've already talked about how really shortening Diamondbacks is really unfortunate for them. Yeah. They they probably need to uh, not shorten it. Well, they all. just really need to make sure to bold the CKS yes. <laughs> on that jersey. Yes, because you you... It sounds like you're insulting them yeah. as you. The D-back? Yep, the D-backs. <laughs> that guy looks like a D-back. Oh, wait, he's he a is. I mean, it says it on his uniform. <laughs> I was like, that's Seeger. He's, he's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So, Ryan, I don't know if you can speak to this, but I keep hearing all these Ranger fans complain about John Smoltz and his announcing like he's some big Ranger hater. <laughs> I don't know if he's a Ranger hater, but he... It it doesn't seem like it's just the Rangers. That's the problem. It seems like whatever um, game that he is commenting on, he will just whatever team's up, he just uses it an excuse to talk about the team that is losing currently. <laughs> <laughs> so smoltsy, smoltsy, smoltsy. That's hard smoltsy. To say. I think it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Smoltz is okay. Right? I think it just seems one-sided because the Rangers have won three games out of four in this series, so there's not been a lot of chance for him to talk about the Rangers when they're down. Yeah, so I'm <laughs> I'm rooting for the Rangers, and I have a special place for them in my heart, living in Texas and going to so many games. But I still say, for the most part, I don't have a dog in the fight. I mean, I really want them to win, but won't be terribly brokenhearted, but 
as someone who's been watching all the games, I, I don't see it with Smoltz. I mean, I, I I do see that sometimes he he tries to make it more exciting. Like last night when it was a blowout, uh, Smoltz is talking about how the Diamondbacks could come back and right, you know, pushing that. Which and, would and I think that's the what game his job more is. exciting yeah. overall. Like nobody wants to see a blowout. That's what he's I want to see a blowout yeah. because I want to see the Rangers win and win dominantly. Yes. But <laughs> no one else that's not a fan of either of these teams wants to watch a blowout. <laughs> that's right. Well, I mean, that's one thing that makes the World Series so great is you stress, especially if you're a fan, you stress over every single pitch. Mm, unless it's yeah. a blowout. Then you can kind of rest easy. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but even when it's that. like 10 to nothing, <laughs> like a guy gets on base and you're like, oh, crap. Like they're going to come back. Oh, no, they're going to get nine runs. He just walked inning. a guy. <laughs> I'm pulling I'm pulling for the Rangers for two reasons. One, I, I still feel sorry for the way uh, – sorry. I just – you know, they're still smarting over the way the Cardinals ripped their hearts out. In, was that 11, 2011? That's, what, that, that, that I don't even know if the Cardinals ripped their hearts out. I feel like the Rangers ripped their own hearts out. I'll take it. Either way. <laughs> either way. But number two is I just don't like D-backs. So. Yeah, no one does. Yeah, <laughs> got to stay away from him. I mean, look at that guy. He's clearly a D-back. That hair, those glasses. Speaking of D-backs, I was in I was in Nashville um, <laughs> last weekend, and I, I was trying from to, Arizona. I was trying to park yeah, in a garage, about? and uh, there was a giant truck that was too big for the parking garage spot in the first place. But there was also like a AC unit or something in the back of the parking spot, so it was it was like extra small. And so this guy was sticking like halfway out. Like everyone was like having to like crawl to go buy him in the uh, parking garage. I was like, come on! Did did he back into the spot? He did. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. He's definitely it, it from was, Arizona. So that night, I believe, I think uh, was the Maple Leafs were playing the Predators. I was like, that guy's probably a Maple Leaf fan. Oh, yeah. clearly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> clearly Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> that's the worst good. kind of Canadian. He's like Albertan or something like that. <laughs> French Canadian. <laughs> Those are the worst. But but nothing, no offense, uh, you know, meant towards our Canadian listeners. No, right. Especially not those at all. From, uh, There's a bunch. That area, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of coworkers in Calgary, and they're all super nice people. Yeah, so Calgary. But, what, they're the Flames, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're they're great people. Yeah. And what Calgary, if the Flames obviously... played the D backs? <laughs> the Flame and D backs. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be, be interesting. Great, great name for that. that be, match. We are lucky that Grant is not here. <laughs> <laughs> or not lucky. We're missing out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> As you've noticed, Grant is not here, but uh, the three of us are, and we're just enjoying yeah. post Halloween uh relaxation. It is now November the month of thanks and we express thanks on our social media today to our listeners Mm -hmm. because you guys have been great uh we had we have over four thousand podcast listens just on youtube spotify and apple and then like almost 127,000 views on our social media clips which may not seem like a lot if you're like some big you know influencer or anything like that but you know I, I I like our little uh, crowd of folks that interact with us. Yeah. Well, well, how many social videos do we have? Like 126,500 and something. Yes. So they've been watched once or so, one point yep. two times. Thankfully, like Ethan and uh, Tyler. And Nate. So yeah, Nate and Andrew, Detroit, babe. What you said <laughs> that he tried to call our Instagram. Yeah, I I was How does that work? I was out. So this this is November first when we're recording. So last night I was out trick or treating with my kids and I thought I felt my phone vibrate and I pulled it out of my pocket and it said a call for the dude facts podcast Instagram. And I was like, uh, and then it said like Nate Enzor or whatever, whatever I'm, is that one of your daughter's friends? I think he's one of, yeah, he's one of that. that friend. So he's friends with Ethan, I think, cause then they uploaded a story to their Instagram and tagged us and it had a picture of Ethan on it and it showed like a missed call from, from dude facts or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. I wonder, cause let's see, I know I can't just put it right up in a camera here, but this is what he went as some character from 
anime or something? Or is, is that Ethan? It's like Red Scream or something. I don't know. Yeah. So it, clearly that's the devil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like um, there's a there's a video game. <laughs> I accidentally just <laughs> I accidentally just called Nathan's or sorry. <laughs> so if you get a missed like, call, oh, I, I was trying to bring it back up and. Uh, Maybe he'll call back and we can just talk to him should here on the we, podcast. Yeah, should we just talk to him live? So if he calls back, Nate, if you're not listening to this live, <laughs> yeah, you aren't. Yeah, he sent in an attachment, but there's no attachment. So we'll see what happens. No. I was going to say, there's, there's a video game that basically has a bunch of like monsters and like slasher movie villains and stuff like uh, that, that yeah, where like. they chase people down and try to kill them and stuff like that. There, that is like a version of Scream in that game. Oh, um, okay. So maybe that's what he was going on. So the guy who's dating my daughter dressed up like a guy who chases people down the street. Yep. Yeah. Well, Satan. That's good to know. Satan. Master of lies. <laughs> <laughs> the, deceiver, the deceiver of the brethren. That's right. The master of lies or lice? Or both. both. Yeah. <laughs> lies and lice. I guarantee you. It's a double whammy. Lice. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, he would be he would be the Pam in this situation. He would be the one to introduce lice to people, but then blame yes. Meredith. Yeah, that's true. That's Sounds about right. So the the D backs have a guy on base. <laughs> Just to let you know. <laughs> and oh, he's, trying he's trying to steal. steal. <laughs> that's what a D back would do. Anyway, oh, oh, out. he he put that glove all over that uh, D backs, but <laughs> but he's safe. Man. <laughs> Everyone thought they were tuning in for the New Tech Podcast. This is uh, actually yeah. just World Series commentary. Yeah, we, so, we really hate to spoil the game for you. If that. the D-backs end up like really doing well here, you, Ryan might just get angry and storm off. So, okay. well, I don't know. There's still he would just get really quiet. Yeah, there's still still two more games for the Rangers to lose, and they have proven to me before that they could lose those games. Look at that guy! The way he just <laughs> winked at the camera. That's a that's a definite feedback. <laughs> so this was a this was a big week. Obviously, we got the World Series going on, Halloween. Now we're transitioning into November, time of thanks. But uh, one of our favorite comedians was on uh, Saturday Night Live, oh, Nate yeah. Bargatze, and yeah. uh, it was pretty funny. It was, yeah, funny. it was some of the the best sketches like overall, like the, the entire episode that I've seen in a while. Yeah. That George Washington sketch Hilarious. was so well written. <laughs> yeah. It was genius. You know, I, I loved everything about that episode, but I think, and I don't really watch SNL. Every now and then I'll catch a clip, but uh, we wa- we recorded it and then watched it because I don't stay up until 10. When did it start coming on at 10.30? I thought it came on at 9.30. It's always been 10.30. Yeah, it's always been pretty late. Yeah, Gosh, I must it, live on the East Coast since 11.30. Maybe when I was yeah. in my it's 20s and younger, 10.30 <laughs> felt like 9.30. I was like, I used to watch Conan all the time, but that was because I didn't have, I was up at, 1130 at uh, night. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But um, I, I think the best sketch on, as far as the way it was written and acted out, was the very last one with the writers eating dog food. Oh, my just, goodness. That was hilarious. That was so funny. It was funny. Very <laughs> funny. It was great. That, but I told Bridget when we started watching it, I don't know if you guys felt this way or not, because I've listened to Bargazzi since before... I just stumbled upon him mm-hmm. um, yep. on Spotify or something, and we listened. Oh, because I was looking for like, clean comedians, and this had been several years ago. And uh, while he was doing stuff like Zane, he was always on. Mm-hmm. Um, so when he was, so when he made SNL, he's on there. I told Bridget, like, I'm kind of proud. You know, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know the guy, but I felt proud. He's representing like, Nashville and yeah. Tennessee, and he stayed clean. I love that. Yeah, but I was wondering where. Well, yeah, he stayed true to him to his, to his himself and he his did. content. So. He did. His opening yeah. monologue was fantastic. It Great was. stand-up. He he has the best dry humor, like of yeah. any like current comedian. Great delivery. Yeah, it's it's. I don't know what it is. Like he just the way he says stuff, and then he just, he pauses at just the right times yeah. to just make it so funny. <laughs> well, not, I want so we. He's a good singer, apparently. In that mm. the the Lake Beach song. Oh, Lake Beach is great. <laughs> Silas and I have been singing That's Lake so Beach great. all week. I was watching that and I was like, who who was at my like family get togethers over the summer growing up? <laughs> Did you ever get a snapping me. turtle to the midsection? No, no not not good. never caught on my, on my D, my dong. <laughs> Your D back. My D back, yeah. Um, the, the the part where the kid drinks the like he the thought dip. it was alcohol and it was dip. Yep. 
<laughs> that was so funny because it's so true. It's definitely happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about someone who drank dip, but I thought about a couple that I don't want to name any names <laughs> that we knew from high school that was a part of the crew that he dipped. And then apparently, like, they would make out while he had dip in his mouth. Or that was the story. That was the yeah. joke that went around. That, that was what we all said. That's what we all said. I don't want to say it was true. So I definitely want to say no. <laughs> I hope it wasn't true. But I went back to fun. that, and I thought, oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> but, but you know, they're married now. Yeah, so it worked so, out. So, yeah, it worked. And there's kids. <laughs> 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 but oh, what I was, what I was going to say is he can sing, and, and he can act. You know? Oh, yeah. It, so I would... Love to see if this opens up doors for him to maybe get into a movie or something at some point. Oh, yeah. Uh, it'd be great. Oh, yeah, it'd be amazing. I was listening to the Nate Land podcast a little bit, actually on my way home today, and they were talking about SNL, and uh, it was fun to hear the other guys talk yeah. about how proud they were. Uh, Dusty Slay got on there and said, yeah, it was just neat. You know, I'm, I'm watching my friend up there on the SNL stage. Yeah. And uh, it was funny. I, I sort of felt the same way that you did, Josh. And I've been listening to him for five or six years. But just the fact that he's from Nashville and it's clean and, and you know, I think he even referenced the Wilson County Fair yeah, on the did. SNL stage, yeah, which was did. great. It, it just felt like somebody from our backyard mm-hmm. up on the stage. And I thought that was really cool. So uh, one of the guys from Nate Land, I was trying to find the date if I could. Um, is going to be at Zany's. Um, it's not a slow guy. Um, Aaron. Is Aaron Weber. Is that breakfast? Who he calls breakfast? I don't remember. But Aaron, yeah, he's going to he's be. He's funny. He's funny. He's going to be um, at Zany's. Aaron Weber. He he did a small um, a small bit when I went and saw Dusty Slay. Um, he he was one of the openers for Dusty, and he he was hysterical. Well, I can't find it real quick, but um, yeah, yeah, I'd love to see him. Mm-hmm. I, I like to see him. And he's a you know the the cool thing about Nate. If you don't if you don't listen to Nate Land, that's a great listen. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's fun. Um, of course, a lot of humor. It's, you got several comedians on there, and it's clean. Yeah, uh, and and I I think some of at least when we started doing a podcast for me that was part of like inspiration i think of how i envision us doing some things you know very humor based and we've talked about that mm-hmm. you know we want we want to make sure that you know we have time just to laugh together um but they're all i don't know if they're all believers um but they they have a lot of uh, conversation about things that are biblical or about church related things and um so it's just it's just a good podcast so if you're not listening to that check out Nate Land um, we're doing a we're going to shamelessly plug uh, them. Uh, home run. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it was a home run. Oh, no. No, it's showing a replay. Woo. Oh, all right. <sighs> but because uh, yeah, we, we want them to shout us out or at least respond to something we post about them. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. We want the algorithms algorithms to tell them that we've talked about Nate Bargatze a lot because Nate Bargatze is a great guy and Nate Bargatze is a great comedian. Y'all heard of Nate Bargatze? Have anybody seen Nate Bargatze a lot? Yeah. Did you say Nate Bargatze? Yeah, Nate Bargatze. Oh, okay, yeah. I know yeah. Nate Bargatze. Okay. Yeah. Nate Bargatze! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was funny. It was a great show. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, lots of lots of fun things happening. And uh, we we do not have our regular, like, comment. Sorry, I'm just really captivated by Timothy Chalamet's <laughs> eyes right now. <laughs> Some ad on TV. It's probably like a cologne. Yeah, or that's got to be. Yeah, uh, that, exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chanel. But uh, we didn't. We got a few comments, but uh, we're not going to do our regular comment section. Um, most of them involved the conversation that we had about, uh, you know, older people trick or treating. And so I don't yeah. know if we wanted to revisit that thought because I think people assumed that we were like, no older people trick or treating ever. And that's not necessarily, I think, what we were saying. We weren't? I, I, I think we were like, we were just commenting on the fact that it seems like people are older now, trick-or-treating. And yes, if you're like an old parent and you don't have a costume on, like, come on, like, at least give some effort. But uh, yeah, like, 
we we love giving candy out and uh, it's perfectly okay. But what I thought was funny is there was a guy who commented, and I don't remember on which uh, social media account, but he said something about like, give them the candy, like they can all come to my house. And and then I replied, I'm coming to your house. Did he give his address? And then he put something on there like, yeah, come on. And I was like, I will. And, and then he deleted all his comments. Oh. Uh, and I was like, this guy probably really thinks I was like trying to yeah. look him up. He's an Arizona And uh, show up at his house. <laughs> so if you're out there listening, random dude, I'm coming over and I'm trick-or-treating. I think he likes the D-backs. Probably does. <laughs> <laughs> He's a closet D-backs fan. <laughs> so, you know, we, we uh, the neighborhood we live in is a dead end. And apparently there used to be a lot of young kids on the street, but they've all grown. They're teenagers now. And we had probably 20 kids stop by last night. Not a ton. Uh, but most were probably teenagers but they were all dressed up you know they, they weren't being weird it, there was nobody like 16 or older i don't think mm-hmm. they're kind of the young teenagers but what i want to discuss if we have a minute or two have you guys seen there's been a few videos this happens every year where somebody is caught on a person's ring doorbell like they they're setting their i have i have a different kind of perspective here but they'll set a bowl of candy out on the porch and maybe a sign of like take one and go or whatever. Mm, yeah. But they there's this video that kind of went around. I saw it on did you say Twitter or X? X. Went around X. on Twitter, Twitter X. Twitter X. And <laughs> um, that I saw today. Wex. And it's it's like Elon's world. At least one grown lady with a kid or an older kid, and they're taking everything out of this bucket. They're like full on candy bars and just taking it. And so everybody's blasting them. I kind of tend to the side of if you're going to leave a bowl of full size candy bars out on your front porch and you're not going to open the door to regulate who gets it. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. you're setting yourself up for that. I mean, there's definitely there's definitely something to be said about the parent that is just yeah, now, raiding that. But yeah, that parent's a D bag. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Well, I won't they're say they're anything about me right taking now. a Reese's take five out of a bowl <laughs> last night. But they, uh, you know. Uh, you lose the right to complain about it. I feel like if you yeah, it's still not right. Yeah, exactly. But then complaining about it is well, you should have not done that. Yeah, exactly. You know the world we live. It's like next time, don't do that. It could be worse. So my neighbor put on the neighborhood. We have like a neighborhood Facebook page. He uh, left a bowl out because his kids are younger. They went to bed after trick or treating, so he left a bowl out for the rest of the trick or treaters. Someone just took his whole bowl. Like the actual bowl. He said, hey, fine with you taking all the candy. I don't want it, but please return the bowl. <laughs> like, who steals a bowl? Like, what do you need with a bowl? Man. But, yeah. Too bad he doesn't have the video of that. I know. You can figure out which of your neighbors is a jerk. <laughs> I know, because we only have like seven neighbors. Yeah, you don't have a lot. <laughs> Just yeah. one street. You don't have anybody that comes in from like other neighborhoods to here to like church. I mean, why would you? It's only like no, a few houses. I feel like there are some people that like just drive their kids around and they just like neighborhood hop. Like yeah. they'll just yeah. go around, find a couple smaller ones, and then they hit like the big ones. Yeah, know, oh. later in the, the ones week. they know are giving out the full size candy bars. Yeah. Yeah, and like hundred dollar bills and stuff like that. <laughs> Where, where's the Where's that yeah, neighborhood? Where's that neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go. Next <laughs> so how, now, now that it's oh good, no, go ahead because I'm transitioning to like just something say, totally how different. How was your Weird Al costume received oh, from yeah. your neighborhood? So it was great by the older crowd. <laughs> so <laughs> we <got> we, <laughs> we walked out to this area in our neighborhood, but then we went over. We actually neighborhood hopped. We went to a bigger neighborhood where there was lots of houses. And uh, we would walk past groups of kids and they commented on my daughter who was dressed as an axolotl and kids ate that up. They're like, oh, axolotl. No I kids. Have no, no idea what you're talking about. No kids knew who I was. So an axolotl is like a salamander mm-hmm. from Mexico. Oh, okay. And uh, it's, it, it's like, a, it, it honestly looks like it has a smile on its face. Mm. And I it's it's real cute it. looking. Is it is it a character in something as well? So or it's it so it's in Minecraft, which uh, I, is where my kids know it okay. from. But I think there are other like cartoons and stuff that use axolotls because they're actually going extinct, I believe. Um, there's not many axolotl of them out in the wild. It's yeah. pink too, right? It's pink. Okay. Yeah. Your daughter's doing good work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. 
but but the kids just ate it up. And in the course, I did have a group of kids at one point who were being real obnoxious already. My son was dressed as a banana, and they were like trying to harass him for some reason. And uh, they because went up. They're insecure. They, they, they just came up to me and they're like, "Who are you?" And I just kind of stared at him for a second. And I was like, I'm Weird Al! And I screamed it like really loud. And then they all like got silent. And we just kept walking. <laughs> I don't think they had any idea they who Weird Al was. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who Weird Al is, but I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> but my neighbor, who actually is a DJ for Q108, the morning show. So if you ever hear Kyle on Q108, he's my neighbor right across the street. He saw my outfit and he loved it. He was like, Weird Al! <laughs> Man, I gotta watch that movie. And he just freaked out. So, what's his name? Kyle. 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 Are, are, is he is he a listener? Maybe does he know about the podcast? No, he has uh, no idea. <laughs> Every time he comes over, I'm lifting weights in the garage, and I'm like right in the middle of a set, and he's trying to talk to me. So it's all it's usually awkward we conversations. The dude facts. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just trying to see if we can get a connection with q and Yeah, maybe I need to go out there at some point. Normally his kids are running around like crazy. So like, hey, can um, I take advantage of our friendship? Yeah. I mean Silas is nice to his kids. Maybe I need to take advantage of that. We do like an episode of Dude Facts like from your driveway. Why don't you out there record Yeah, we could. See if he notices. <laughs> <laughs> see if he notices if we're recording hey. a podcast in his driveway. <laughs> In his driveway? Yeah, you know what you're saying? <laughs> no, this, oh. driveway, but that would be I'm even like, better. Yeah. We just There's set no up in his driveway. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we could just go on location to his driveway. Yeah, we could. <laughs> like, welcome to Dude Facts on location <laughs> from Kyle's yeah, driveway. Yeah, we, we have a guest, Kyle, from Q108. I mean, he's, we're in his driveway. Yeah, he comes out. Like, oh, welcome to the show. Honestly, Enjoy knowing us. him, he's very talkative. He probably would just sit down and start talking. Yeah. So, pretty funny. But, you know, speaking of radio stations, when when is it too early? It's November 1st. When is it too early for Christmas music? Yes. It, it's currently <laughs> too early. I saw somebody putting, like, you know, somebody posted a thing of Mariah Carey on Facebook, and I was like, no, don't even start. Yeah, I, I, I don't even want to see her I think face. I silenced their notifications for 30 days on my Facebook. <laughs> that, I'm going to start taking action like that. That's, that's brilliant, Ryan. I'm just going to start silencing all people who talk about Christmas. Yep. This early. I like the meme of her that had gone around a bit that she's thawing out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's in a block of ice that's thawing out. Um, so I used to be a real staunch nothing Christmas until the day after Thanksgiving. Like I don't want that's kind of been the rule in our house. If I'm in the car, there's no Christmas music. The day after yeah. you can listen to it. Mm. If you do it on your own, that's okay, but no tree, no whatever. In the last few years I've softened a bit and um, we put our tree up like a week before Thanksgiving this year. I know. And uh, I feel like I've backslidden. But Where I have, am I with the sound effect? I have soft. Wait, wait. What's going on here? Talk about a D-back move. They have a hot tub in their stadium. A swimming pool. I, I bet that's the nastiest hot tub. Anyways. America. That's a hot tub. There's a person sitting in there with just a marble red just hanging out yeah, their lip. That's, <laughs> that's a Petri. <laughs> that's a Petri dish. But um, I'm okay like the week of Thanksgiving. There we go. I think That's once it. you watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, that after that, up. you can... Yes. Whatever you want. Goes Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's the, that's I, I agree. I, I can go with that. Yeah. Because the Macy's Day Parade is ushering in Christmas. Right. Exactly. Santa. Yeah. But we still haven't eaten our Thanksgiving meal by the time Santa comes. It's all right. I mean, the Thanksgiving meal is just really warming up for uh, Christmas. Yeah. It's, so. it's like straight You see him come in like, all right, now we need to go ahead and eat. We're celebrating. <laughs> Christmas is about to begin. I've already been eating since like 6 a.m. though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well just keep going. Yep. I mean, wake I, up, I some wake eggs up. and bacon. I mean, you're like Michael Bunch Scott. You've got a George bacon. Foreman next to the bed and it's <laughs> got a turkey leg on it. <laughs> like the pilgrims did it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I like that Nate Bargatze compared himself to a pilgrim, pilgrim. by the way. So <laughs> SNL, Nate Bargatze, you gotta go and watch Check it. Check it out, yeah. Some oh, great you some it. great clips. Oh yeah. Especially that Lake Beach. Check it out. <laughs> so Dave, Dave Grohl popping into Lake Beach made yeah. me laugh so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blew his hand off. <laughs> 
and he was the preacher. Yeah. Oh, that was great. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> That's why people are deconstructing their faith. What it a transition. Is. Great Look at that. transition. Because yeah. a pastor's like that. Yep. A blown pastor who's hands. angry at cornhole and blowing off his hands and Shows cursing. Up in the pulpit. Yep, that's right. <laughs> no wonder. So watch that video and then you'll understand a little bit yeah. about uh, deconstruction and what we're going to be talking about today. So I guess that offers a great transition yeah. into yeah. our topic. So we'll begin talking about this. Um, if we yell and scream because of the ball game, seriously, you'll just have to excuse us. There are more Please important don't, things uh, than deconstruct. <laughs> about deconstruction. Even though I wish they had deconstruct the D-backs right now. <laughs> Well, maybe we can discuss how they do that here. So, yeah. Yeah. So, we were going to talk uh, a little bit about this topic of deconstruction. And uh, it's one of those things that it's a word, I think, that carries a lot of different definitions or understandings of what it's all about. I think even in some of our texting through it, um, like you you had mentioned, I went through some of that as, as a kid or through maybe your college years or whatever. Yeah. But college, young adult. That's kind of like more yeah. of... And I'm kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but I, I think that's not so much like the what you went through with so much we call deconstruction is just figuring out what is actually true because you want to know what's true. But you have people that might define it that way. You have others that are going to define deconstruction as, as com- a, a complete breaking down of the Christian faith um, and trying to justify it away. Right. Uh, and, and, so on, and then deconvert, if you will. Um, and there have been a lot of... Uh, celeb like Christian celebrities or leaders, it seems like over the past several years that have gone through what they would call deconstruction, and and now you just kind of hear the term a lot, especially if you're on social media. I did a search today, and um, just for hashtag deconstruction on Instagram, and there were almost five hundred thousand hits on that today. So a lot of people are are using the word are are discussing it, sharing about maybe what that looks like for them. And so, soon we'll add to that with our short we're video. We're going to add to it. We may add another half yeah. a million. <laughs> it out. So, um, yeah, so let's just, let's maybe try to get into a little, uh, a little definition of it just so we can have maybe a, explain to people who have never heard what deconstruction is um, or have never heard the term or just maybe confused about it. Um, so for our, our purposes, really, someone who says that they have deconstructed their faith, in essence, is somebody who looks back at what they have been taught as specifically as a Christian, talking about the Christian faith, mm-hmm. what they've been taught, exposed to, maybe even what they have claimed for themselves in the past, and something has happened to where they're now questioning what they have believed. And they're going through this process. I mean, if you think like you're building a house, you're constructing a house, you know, it's element by element, you're putting it together. So deconstruction is kind of element by element, taking it apart. And um, the motivation usually is to, or is, or we're told is to find what, what really are the lasting true elements of Christianity. You know, what are the things that were lies or not actually correct or or whatever in, in whatever manner you mean those things uh to get down to what's actually true um and i was listening i want to make sure we shout out this podcast as well because there's there's some content that i'll share that really comes from from them it's called uh Beer, the beards and bible podcast and these guys are a tennessee podcast uh they're out of well, one of the guys is out of um cannon county which is woodbur woodbur tennessee and uh, he is the pastor at the Experience Church in Cannon County. And uh, he's there's another guy that's on there with him that's a pastor as well. And they, they did a great series on deconstruction. I'd encourage you to check them out. Um, but one of the things that, that they said when listening to it is like there's a, there's, there's a difference also between deconstruction and deconver- decon- deconversion. Like you'll hear both of those two. Mm-hmm. And um, they wanted to be very careful, which I think is good for our conversation as well. To point out that not everyone who goes through um, deconstruction of their faith deconverts as well. So that's usually a healthy kind of practice. But apparently, the majority of people who 
deconvert have went, they had to go through some sort of process of deconversion. And a lot of people who deconvert, who go through, I'm saying this wrong, a lot of people who deconvert have gone through a process of deconstructing. Deconstruct. Thank right. you. And a majority of people who deconstruct end up deconverting, un, you know, saying I'm not a Christian anymore. And there's been several uh, Christian leaders, um, celebrities, if you will, uh, over the last few years, as I mentioned earlier, who have done that. Um, most notable, Joshua Harris, mm -hmm. uh, or I think would be to a lot of people, especially in our generation, uh, Kevin Max, um, and um, guys like, um, who are the two guys? That Rhett, and Link. Rhett and Link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they were doing stuff even for VeggieTales at one point, and now have said that they're, I guess, uh, hopeful agnostics. Um, it's probably because it wasn't called Produce Tales. Probably. That was their trigger. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you, I mean, <laughs> what's been your experience like hearing about deconstruction? It, to, to me, it's something that I've just heard over the last few years. I don't know if it's something that's been going on. De deconstruction is like a idea I've heard for years is just like a philosophical idea. It is a, you know, at, at its core, it is just a way that we can look at text or conceptual arguments and things and it's just a way of determining you know what is you know what is true to you at you know from that but i think that the idea of deconstruction in our current society has kind of taken this form of you know almost like this popular um just like a trendy word and people just like found it and and hooked on it when, you know, people have been questioning their faith and, you know, people who deconvert or um, fall away from the church or whatever, people have been doing that for years. That's that's nothing new. But for some reason, we just, I feel like the culture today needs to really tries to find a word that they can just like coin and like get behind, get something behind it. And I feel like the deconstruction was just kind of the the thing that everybody latched onto early on. And it's, and it's just gotten to the point where it's just ramped up you know, on social media and with, you know, people that are in the public eye. And it's just become a bigger thing than what it originally is, is just a, from its original concept. Um, and I think that's really what, we, what we're what we talking about when we're talking about deconstruction here is what it's become in today's, you know, culture and zeitgeist, not necessarily the base concept of what it can be. Um, and I, I've definitely seen a lot of it. I've seen, you know, you scroll through TikTok enough, you'll just stumble upon people that are talking about it. I've seen, I've seen people that are still, you know, maintain that they are believers and that they did not follow with them for they, from, from faith, but they do say that, yeah, I, you know, I deconstructed and, you know, I, I looked at things and, and, you know, I see things differently now. Um, so I, I think, uh, I think it's pretty just it's a it's a, a, a hot topic for the people to talk about now which I think is uh why we see so much of it. And and what's the hashtag they use is XN exvangelical. Exvangelical, yeah. Yeah, so you see that a lot and I agree. I think it's there's a lot of trendiness to it and that term deconstruction really just sort of has been morphed to represent all of that even though I would agree that deconstruction people have been doing for a long time. And some of that's just people questioning. We might have called it questioning your faith, but in a good way, too. I mean, you question your faith and you really own it and you really figure out why do I believe this and what is it about this? And, you know, you, you ask good questions and you um, search for answers against questions maybe that you never thought of before that you're challenged with, especially when you go to college and, uh, you know, maybe you have conversations with people that believe differently. And so I think a lot of that has been happening for years, but now we do have this sort of idea of deconstruction as uh, one, it, it's very trendy. People, I think I've found support on social media. And so it's a lot easier for people just to sort of be vocal about it and say, oh, I've deconstructed. Whereas I think people before just kind of maybe walked away from the faith, but never really tried to process it. Now they're processing it more, but then you legitimately have people that um, you know, for whatever reason, and we can get into all the reasons, whether it be through some influence of, uh, you know, things that they're learning in higher education or politics, which I think is what drives this quite a bit, um, especially in those celebrities. I, I find it hard to really see there being any other reason 
when these celebrities talk, a lot of times it's driven by politics and postmodern thought. It's, hey, these are all the things that I believe on how the world should run. Christianity and the faith and the Bible don't match up with that. So now I can't believe that. Um, I, and that, that maybe that's not fair to label all of it like that. But a lot of what I've seen has, has been that. Um, or whether it be just bad experience. And I think, um, you know, there's some people that I've known and even people that I've worked with in ministry who've been through some really awful experiences and that some of them have, as we're just labeling it, deconstructed and turned away from their faith. And it's been sad to see, but, you know, part of it is, you know, we, we have some snakes within the church and uh, wolves within in sheep's clothing, as you will. And uh, unfortunately, that's a, a byproduct of that reality. Yeah, I uh, agree um, with what you guys have said. I and so the the term deconstruction is fairly new. Like it, some author, and I wish I had. I was more professional in this, and I had like the author of the book and all this. There was an author that was using this term to talk about people who were kind of tearing down the Christian faith. Um, coined it, and it's what was grabbed onto. Mm. Uh, I think. The unfortunate thing is that the term deconstruction has taken on the meaning of somebody who is specifically changing their what they say Christianity is or should be based off of personal belief. Um, that that seems to be the area uh, or, or, or the mode that I see it most often. Used and when you see things on social media, it's people who have a belief that they hold on to that might not be biblical. So because of that, they have to deconstruct their Christianity. Like they've come to accept or believe or desire something that traditional Christian ethic would say is not biblical. And so there's this effort to say, well, I've got to deconstruct. I've got to leave. It's got to be something different for me in order to hold on. Um, which may not be fair to people who are actually going through that process that we talked about, you went through. And I think that, I think that pretty much anyone, especially those of us who have been believers from a young age or grew up in the church, had to go through a process of, okay, I believe this for myself now. It's it's not because my parents do, but I look at it. I believe these things are true. In that, there have been. Um, Items that are the the minors, if you will, of Christianity that I have gathered my own conviction on, my own thought on, um, that there's freedom to have some of that, just like Halloween, like we talked about last time. But the majors don't change in that. Like the, the major things of doctrinal belief, I would say that's not necessarily deconstruction, uh, but a term that the, the guys in the Beards and, and Bible podcast use was. Um, untangling their faith, where there may be some things that we heard or people heard growing up in church that were extra biblical, mm-hmm. they, that, that, they, that their pastor or their church or their parents or their culture and wherever they were added into Christianity of these are the things you do or you don't do. And those are unhealthy. Um, and it's not, so we're not taking blame away from churches. I think we'll talk more about that. But that's, I think that's the healthy end. Like you're coming out of something, okay, wait a minute, this might not be completely true. Um, so I, the, the difference, I think, is this. You're either approaching this idea of deconstruction. I think people approach it one of two ways. One way is, okay, there is an absolute truth. God determines that. Therefore, I want to know what he says is true. And I want to deconstruct, take away everything that's been added on top of that. Mm-hmm. Right. I want to, okay, what are the things that I've been taught that I've believed, owned, accepted my whole life, whether it came from my church, or my parents, and I'm not sure all this is biblical. Okay, what does God say is right and true? Right. So I'm going to go through that process. That's probably more of what you well, did. Just to kind of give some insight on what you know my journey was like with that. I my my journey of deconstructing or untangling was more of just like looking at the Bible and separating 
separating that from kind of like Christian culture and what, what, you know, what is like the popular thing in Christianity to believe or do, you know, um, that type of thing. And, and looking at the Bible more so because, because I think if you read the, if you look at the Bible and you read it as a one-to-one, like, Hey, it says this, you know, it applies to me current day exactly like this. I think that is a disingenuous way to look at the Bible. And I think, but I think that's a way that the Bible has been looked at historically by Christianity and Christian culture. And so my, my kind of deconstructing was kind of looking at the Bible and trying to understand it more in its context and its place and not try to extrapolate things from it that it's not trying, that it's not saying or not, you know, not necessarily condoning, but may exist in the Bible and, you know, kind of in- increasing my knowledge of study on it rather than just, you know, kind of reading it in this kind of, you know, basic one-to-one way, which it's really like not. Like it's written directly to you. Right, exactly. Like, like it's not. written like, hey, like Paul said this, and he's saying that to you in your seat right there. And I'm like, no, Paul said that to a church that was in a very specific situation and around certain social circumstances. That if we look at that all together, we can glean important things for our lives today, but it may not necessarily be, you know, exactly what is said is what you need to, you know, understand. You know, take from that. And, and, that, that and, is, and that's what you were talking about, that extra biblical yeah. Yeah. stuff that people have issue with. And, um, you know, I, I think that one that obviously leads to worship of a false god in the church, which is a problem. And no wonder people yeah. break away from that because it, I mean, we, it can go down a rabbit trail of so many like warped and perverted beliefs um, but there's a lot of that that I think Christians in that Christian culture that you talked about that I think is well-meaning, but has gotten so far removed from Scripture and what it's actually saying and who the God of Scripture actually is that it has created. It's almost like subculture and, you know, almost, um, you know, let's just call it what it is, false religion in a way that some people follow and uh, I think it's good for all of us to go back and look at scripture and say, all right, you know, wh- where have I been getting it wrong? And quite frankly, I think we're going to make mistakes. And there are times every single week where I'm reading the Bible now and I look and it's like something just clicks that hasn't ever clicked before. And I'm like, wow, OK, that's that's actually how I need to be listening to God or doing this. And I mean, it, it we're constantly learning and constantly growing. but that's not what we're talking about here. I don't think, I think we're talking about when we get so far removed or when the church gets so far removed and it it bleeds into other areas of life. And I know we'll talk politics, but you know, when, when those lines get blurred, you know, I think we see a huge sort of deconstruction or exodus from the church. And I think we saw one in around 2020, but really in the time that our last president was in office, because there was such a divide made and Christians, not all Christians, but Christians as a whole decided to take a stance on one side of the political sphere. And that drove so many away. And I think that's where we saw a lot of this being a trend, especially in like Christian celebrity circles, because they wanted to remove themselves from that political arena and thought, which really, some of it stemmed from that false belief and false beliefs that were being taught that weren't actually scripture based. Well, and that was one thing I thought you brought up Rhett and Link and, you know, I, when they, when they kind of like came out with, you know, and officially said like, Hey, you know, we are believers anymore. We deconstructed. And they, they did, like, they did a whole podcast kind of talking about their own personal stories. I went and listened to the whole thing because, just because I was curious on what their perspectives were. Um, I didn't, you know, obviously didn't agree with everything they said, but there were some things that I thought that I, th- I thought that they themselves came off as very genuine um, in how they were thinking, and I thought that um, I think Rhett on there made a good point, and I wanted to read his quote that he said on the podcast, where 
because I think it's it talks to what you're saying, Jeff, where he said, uh, he said your kids aren't leaving uh, specific the church uh, talking about that. Your kids aren't leaving because you didn't train them enough. Your kids are leaving because you train them well enough to develop a sense of truth and justice. You let them read the words of Jesus. They got it, and they recognize that this the organization doesn't seem to be interested in those words. Um, they're not leaving because they don't know the truth. They're leaving because they do. And I think, you know, maybe that's not fully, um, you know, the case in a lot of a lot of uh, instances with this. But I think that is an important thing that a lot of people are like, hey, I see the church, you know, the the broader overall American church, and I don't see the love that I was taught growing up coming from this place and that, you know, they see that and that, and that is kind of the beginnings of the catalyst for them to look at that. And they're like, Hey, you know, what, what am, what am I, what do I feel about this? And then they kind of, you know, what, unfortunately for a lot of people, what their experience with Christianity is and, and the Bible is based on, culture and not necessarily on their own personal study. And I think they're they're seeing that disconnect and it's causing a rift between a lot of young people specifically in the church overall. Yeah. Um and so this I think this this part of the conversation I think is so important. Um because I, you know in our podcast we want to be able to not we don't want to just rail on people. We want to able to bring hope and encouragement and maybe some bits of um, wisdom, you know, maybe we need to look at things this way, look at things that way. And so we, we've been in the church, we've served the church, we, we were all raised that way. Um, and so we've seen the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there are definite churches um, where the, the word of the pastor or the leadership is m- more true than what scripture would say, right? Like you, this is what, it, this is the truth, and, and you don't question the pastor. Um, and if if you were ever in a church like that, you need to start questioning what you believe Christianity is all about. Mm-hmm. Like you need to go back to the word. Jesus, I mean, Duke. the word tells us. <laughs> yeah, but it was a it was a good one. Um, <laughs> You need to go back to the word and, uh, you know, you take everything back to scripture that, mm-hmm. that you hear taught. The, the churches that probably aren't going to struggle with this as much are the ones where the leadership tells their congregation, I'm not, I'm not infallible. Right. I can mess up. I can say something that's not right. You need to take what I say and always put it against scripture, against the truth of scripture. So if, so then it's on us. Like if you're hearing that, it's on us to say, well, this is right or this isn't, not just to take the word of the guy in the pulpit. But you can be in a church environment where there's this thought of that guy is the the ultimate authority on what is true and what's not. And some guys love that mm-hmm. and, and say that um, and you don't question it. So the, the church has pushed people that way and, and people who have, began to think through their faith, whether they use the term deconstruct or detangle or clarify or own, that's that starts out as a, as a good process. Mm. Um, and I want us to talk in a little bit about what are the things that maybe within a church uh, or that are causing people to, to go down this path. Because it can be very unhealthy if they then are seeing, oh, well, there's all these people I hear about that are deconstructing. And I'm telling you, if you get on social and you just start looking at those things, the vast majority of people who use the phrase deconstruct on a social platform are not doing it in a healthy way. One, they're telling everybody they're doing it. I think that's clue number one. I didn't tell one person, you know, right. in mind, like, yeah, I'm thinking through what I taught. Maybe one person or two people. Now, we didn't have social media back in those days. But if it's, I think if it's a genuine thing, you're probably not just posting about it all the time. Right. That's most anything. Um, but it's usually done in such a way of, I'm really trying to disprove what scripture is saying is true. And I think that's the other way people 
approach it. So one way they approach it is I want to know what God says is true. Then the other camp, I think you can almost go 50-50. Maybe there's a middle ground, but the other camp then are those who say, well, I think this is true. And so it doesn't line up. I don't like what scripture says about this. It's it's probably, it's got to be archaic, outdated. It doesn't fit with our culture. Um, it's not really what they what was meant, blah, 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 all these things. These things that have been held as true since the early church, as I said earlier, like the, the standard of the Christian ethic of living, and now trying to get that to align with personal belief. Um, and so those are the two ways you go towards it. And if your starting point with anything, when it comes, especially when it comes to Christianity, is okay, here's what I believe to be true. Now let me pull away the things in Scripture that don't support that. And that'll be my Christianity. Well, you've, you've created a new religion yeah. at that point. And that, that's something we had texted about earlier, mm-hmm. is, is the religion of postmodernism. And I, don't know, I know there's postmodern thought about different elements in culture. We've we were talking. On yeah, I think that bit. was we were talk. We were texting about it. That Ryan was my I thought. I was thinking fight. more of a, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of screaming, yelling. No. Yeah. I want to see some throwing. That was just my cat, things. though. Um, but uh, no, I th- I think you know I was looking at it more of like postmodernism as like a philosophical kind of process, an argument, so to speak, of just a way of looking at things and talking about things. But I think you're you're thinking of it more as like is a almost like a idealistic kind of uh you know way that you has like shaped your entire you know the way you view everything um well i'm thinking more like christian postmodernism which is yeah taking christian the christian faith and working it to align with cultural norms Right, so what people wish or hope or want Scripture to say, and then challenging Scripture as being the final authority on on certain things in that, um, and and that's the idea of okay, this is it's not Christian at that point, like it's not it's something else. The word Christian may still be there. There are a lot of churches that would say they are Christian churches that are structured in a way or teach a way um, or present themselves in a way that are not biblical. Um, and that's that's then postmodernism, especially uh, when you go into some churches that um, have homosexual leadership, but yet they're teaching, trying to teach Christian faith. Well, at that point, you've definitely crossed a line of, of a clear biblical standard of, of what um, is true, what is right, and what's not. And I think that's part of this deconstruction thing where, where that negative end is is saying okay well, these are the things i want to be true or we need to be true in order to reach our culture and our society therefore i want to remove those things that would stand against that um you know and and you'll hear especially on this end of the argument when you're talking about um transgenderism um lgbtq plus ABC, I don't know. I don't want to be offensive. I just don't know what all the words are. And say, see, the Bible hates these people. Christians hate these people. This is not Christianity. We need something different. When the truth is, I think the majority of churches, I think there's, I don't want to say majority, I think there's a good number of churches of anybody in that culture, in that part of our society, walked in through the front doors. I know it's true of my church. They're going to be loved and welcomed and embraced. We, we want them to come. We want them to be there. Now we're going to teach what Scripture says, but we're not going to that day change the sermon to, oh, we're going to talk about homosexuality today. And, you know, we, we're just going to teach God's Word, but they're more than welcome, welcome to be there. It's when those type of um, elements, uh, sinful elements, are either ignored or embraced. So any any sin when a church does that it's not just homosexuality but i think that's where you see the battleground in our culture is is being focused on that it's not focused on on gluttony or it's not focused on um uh infidelity you know these types of things uh, that's where a lot of that battle is i i would i think part of the 
thing there too is that there's 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 that there's like churches and Christians holding their beliefs and sticking to them, and there's also like taking that and then using that in the political spectrum yeah. to you know basically I feel like I feel like it's used a lot of times to generate a attitude that is less than loving um towards those people when in, you begin to weaponize it. Exactly. Yeah. When you when you take your the that belief that you hold that you you know you think that this is the way you should you know that that you should live and that's the way you you know you read the Bible and you determine that God has decided this is the way that your life needs to be adhered to, then you take that and then in a political spectrum say, all right, now everyone else needs to do this too, regardless if you believe the same they have the same religion, same, you know, morality, same different things that I have that, you know, and you're using that. And then also on top of that are exhibiting aggression and anger towards those people just because they don't agree with you. I think that is where a lot of people see that and they're like, hey, that, you, you know, there might be churches where people would feel loved and welcomed, but on the whole and in, in our society, that's not what they're seeing in media and in, um, you know, politics and things when like I, that. People, I think a lot of it's because that kind of reaction from those churches is what gets shown and shared. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So the, it's probably a minority. I mean, I would think that the, I would say the majority of churches. It's what goes viral. Yeah. Aren't like that. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's those few that go viral. And then you say, Oh, they're all, all Christianity. Yeah. And, and and I think all this stems down to, you know, somebody that's deconstructing their faith or somebody who's claiming the Christian faith or whatever. It's the presuppositions that we take into not only reading the Bible, um, but also the assumptions that we make, such as, uh, you know, about biblical concepts, such as, well, God's a loving God. Well, all right, I'm going to take my presupposition of a loving being wouldn't do this or wouldn't do that, uh, even though the way that God moves and who God is actually is far more, um, you know, incomprehensible than our minds can, you know, get to that our logic can even make sense of. Uh, because I mean, honestly, as a Christian, it's hard for me to still make sense of the fact that. God loved me so much that he sent his son to live a perfect life and then die for my sin on the cross, even though he knows I'm going to still continue to sin even after I trust in that. Like that still blows my mind. I mean, I believe it and I, I follow it, but it still blows my mind that he can do that. Now, w we take that and we run with it. And so a lot of this deconstruction, I think, occurs around, well, a loving being wouldn't do this, this, or that. And then obviously there's bad examples as we've talked about. And so there are clear examples of Christians and people who call themselves Christians doing things that aren't representative of God or his love or what he teaches. But then I think there's also these things that get assumed about God. Um, some of it because Christians have set a bad example or uh, maybe said things that are untrue and it's a different God than the God of scripture, but also because of what people just generally bring to the table. And that's what we're all guilty of. I mean, all of us are guilty of taking our own thoughts, experiences, and reading it into what, how we perceive things. And, and that's just some of that's human nature, but we've also got to be very careful with that. I think, especially when we're talking about the faith and, and we're trying to to break it down or whatever we want to call it. I've had times in my life where I, I've questioned things about the faith and I've worked through that and, and I've, I've had difficult questions that I've wrestled with. Um, you know, in each of those moments, though, I try to be very careful about one, not being prisoner of the moment, but also trying to take myself out of it as much as I can. I'm not saying I do it perfect every time, but you know, we, we have to be cognizant of that. And I think that's where a lot of people are. They've just sort of read their own, you know, that, that they have an idea of what things should be. And if scripture doesn't match it, well, I'm going to throw it all out. Um, or if I 
see people preaching one thing and doing another, well, I'm definitely throwing that out. And to me, that makes sense. I mean, I, I don't want to be a part of something that says one thing and then does the other either. Um, you know, I, if I want to, if I'm going to preach it, I want to make sure I do it too and want to be a part of a church that does the same. But the bride of Christ is, is going to be ugly at times and is going to be messy and it's going to be sloppy. And uh, just as Christ loves his bride, we have to remember that as Christ followers, that he's going to love the mess. And we as Christians got to love the mess as well and, uh, and work through that. And I think some people are unwilling to love the mess or they're just going to love the ones who they feel like they want to love. And then there's some Christians who are like, nope, I'm, we're going to write off all the people that don't think exactly how we think. And so I, re- I really see this happening on both sides. Um, it's just more blatant turning away from the faith in those people that we would say are deconstructing. But there are a lot of Christians who I think are technically deconstructing their faith by following a false God yeah. and chasing after him. And I think that's exactly what Satan wants. He wants people running far from it and he'll attack you from whatever angle. And uh, I, I think it's, that's why it's so pertinent that, you know, one, we're in the word, but also that we're living the word. And uh, two, that we're patient with people as they're going through this process. It's not so much to point fingers and say you're terrible, but that we're patient and very careful with these people that are in the midst of deconstruction, whether they're ones that are claiming they are or ones that we can recognize are, but maybe they don't recognize it. Yeah, and I'd say to the, I don't know if we would have anybody listening to our podcast that is in that moment, but they might be. Maybe there are some people that would say, yeah, I'm kind of going through this. And maybe they're searching for deconstruction. This podcast comes up yeah. or whatever. Um, I, I would say from from a Christian perspective and from a guy who has not, none of us have, but you know, has not lived up to what I've taught at all times. I've had some some definite issues in my life. I I get where that can be a problem for people. And so if that's you, if you're if you're going down that path that's maybe something you heard at church you just know isn't right or you've been hurt by the church, I would just encourage you to consider one thing that we mentioned earlier. How how are you going about it? What's the truth you're looking for? Like if if you really want the truth, start with Start with Scripture. Maybe ignore anything else you've ever been taught. Just start with Scripture. What does Scripture say? If you really want to get to truth and check your motives, are you setting yourself up as the ultimate judge in what is true? Um, and that's a big issue in our society now. Like it's it's what I believe is true. Well, I mean, that's just, that's just impossible to have that thought. If you have a truth, I have a truth. If you have a brain, you know that's impossible, right? If you follow that thought out, it immediately falls apart when my truth doesn't line up with you. I want to show you something that when we were texting earlier about well, why, why you're looking that up before stuff. I forget. That would be my encouragement is make sure that you're really wanting to find where truth is. And we have to be humble enough to know it does not exist within ourselves. Like we don't, we don't come up with that. And then ask questions. Um, uh, Go, I would I would encourage you to try to find people who maybe you're searching for people who have deconstructed and are still Christian or something. I don't know. Maybe go somewhere. Try to find somebody who's maybe gone through that. Talk to somebody because um, you want to make sure that you're not just trying to put your own your own stamp of approval on what you believe and not what someone else is saying. Um, so that's to that person. Now, I think I want to yeah. hear what you have to say, but then I think we need to talk about, you know, where, where is the church? What's our responsibility in this? Um, and how can we rightly love and encourage those who are walking down this path? Right. Um, yeah. Oh, I just, you know, what you were kind of talking about was um, leading kind of into our discussion about, you know, Christian postmodernism and where, you know, postmodernism is really the taken to its extremes is like, you know, Oh, what's true for me is true for me. What's true is you for true. For, like, you know, everything, every truth is subjective to everyone type thing. And I, I found this when I was looking up 
that so it's, it's pre-modern modern and postmodern, and like yeah. postmodern is just like to its extreme is just chaos and yeah. just nonsense because <laughs> there's <laughs> because there's no objective truth and there's nothing no. to direct and guide people and when you when you take that to its you know kind of natural extreme that's definitely the point you're making it yeah. well, your own post, religion in postmodernism like people are going to say um well this is what truth is right because that's it's what i believe well, if you but at the same time they'll say there's no absolute truth but that this is right or this is evil this is good or this is evil and Christians or the church who don't support X, Y, or Z, or don't do this, or do this, they're acting in, in I would say, you're acting in an evil way. Well, once you call something evil, you're saying there's a, there has to be a standard for what's good. And who who can set that? Right. And that's what the, those people, a lot of times, if you talk to them, like, they have their own belief about, like, you know, not, not even just, like, what they believe is true, but, like, the things that they say are unequivocally, like, this is evil, this is good. So like you're still you're still putting a kind of this binary thinking to it and you're absolutist, but it's driven by yourself and yeah. not, you know, some you know, a, a greater moral standard, which, you know, in Christianity that was provided to us by Well, yeah. it the the biggest lie since day one has been that life is about you. Yeah. I mean about yeah. me as the individual. That's what Satan tempted Eve with in the garden. That it was <laughs> life is not about God, but it's about you getting yours. And so since day one, that is where we all are. We wake up, we think about my needs. I've got to pee. I'm hungry. I'm tired, whatever. We automatically default to us and life is not about us. And that how many times has God smacked me on the head and reminded me of that? Hey, life is not about you. <laughs> As I'm praying about God, please fix this, this. God's like, life is not about you. And that's where we get caught up in thought too. And I think we're seeing that to the extreme now. Um, I think it's always been there since day one, but we are seeing it just sort of lived out to the extreme in that we've gotten so wrapped on us that yeah, everybody has their own thought of what is true, and that's a lot. That's a hook, line, and sinker that that gets us all. Is the reality is is no, it isn't what we say is true. That there is one who set truth, and that's the one that created us, and that's the one that we live for. And uh, until we get back to that, obviously, we're going to be having these conversations. Yeah. And this is <laughs> so. I don't know how long we've been going and how much longer we got. Here. Hour 12. So we need to begin the descent, right? Sure. But, um, <laughs> I don't know. Game's yeah. still going. Lame. It's only fifth inning. Yeah. Still zero, zero. Yeah. Still Nothing still exciting. We'll update you guys, even though this game will be over. But I think this is critical <laughs> in this conversation about people deconstructing and the church's role in that, the church's blame in that, if you will, is that there's really only two religions in the world. There's the God as the Bible, as he presents himself, and there's um, self-centered idolism. You know, I, I forget what the theological term is for that. Um, therapeutic, something, something. You're basically just doing what makes you feel good. But it's either, you're either, worship, you're either worshiping, you're, you're either worshiping God as he presents himself in scripture, or you're worshiping yourself. It, it's one or the other. Because you can go to, you say, well, what about this or that? Well, at the end of the day, it's it's about what you're deciding is true. And as Christians, we have to, one, say Christianity is an exclusive belief system. Right? Jesus himself said it, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but yeah. through him. Um, so if you're adding anything to that, taking anything away from that, or ignoring that, you're you are deciding to put your truth on top of what God has established is is uh oh uh oh uh oh uh oh uh oh uh oh did we catch that yeah oh, oh I thought it went over the fence almost Man. a home run stinking they've had two light like that in, the in this in this uh, the two both outs in this inning. see my truth says that was a home run yeah there you go <laughs> well his truth says he caught that yeah see 
So easy example. So the church, yeah, uh, the the church is then, I think, where there are things happening that are causing people to doubt Christianity, and then maybe launch into a deconstruction journey. I'm not gonna say it's always like this because you may that person may not be approaching things rightly or with enough grace, but there's things that apparently are happening within the church where they're presenting an idol not the God of the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be very careful mm-hmm. about that and making sure that all that we do is is done in a way, everything we say, everything we teach is filtered through, okay, what what is God saying is true and right and accurate? And not making not making majors out of minors, um, leaving room for personal conviction and believing things that aren't defined for us in Scripture. But where things are defined, that's our standard. I think what I think of when I think of poor church leadership that leads to what we're talking about, I think of kind of two main camps of things. I think of I think of leaders and um, you know not not just pastors, but also you know other church leaders uh, within the church that are doing things in secret that are hurtful to people, like just just straight up hurtful. Um, and then I think of people that like, you know, the the biggest one that comes to mind is like people like Greg Locke I was about over to say Mount Greg Juliet. <laughs> I was that, hoping you'd that, name names. People yeah. like that are people that are like fundamental Baptist uh, things like that. That they they stand in the pulpit and they say this is right, and if you don't agree with me, and I don't care what you have to say about what Scripture says about it, like you're wrong, and you're and and then they end up, you know, like in Greg Locke's position uses it as a platform for his own political rantings um and and, you know people like that i'm like those are people that are just outwardly making a terrible name for the church well and and on the other end of that spectrum are the nice guys like yeah like a a guy whose name is maybe steven sturdick (laughs) or um or uh, people who are too passive, or, or smiley guy out, in- afraid to say anything. Yeah, no. <laughs> they're either saying nothing, um, or it's just really watered down, or just eh, a tinge off. Yeah. Um, so it's not it's not this overt. Trump is God, you know, like that's who that's God's man. That's who need or whatever it is, Greg Locke. Or it's just these subtle things where they're sowing some seeds of, um falsehood, uh, heresy into like the teaching. And, um, and that's just as dangerous. It yeah, might yeah. even be more dangerous because at least you can see this other end, like, oh, that guy's, yeah, I think most people look at Greg Locke and they're like, Oh, he's a false prophet. Yeah. Now he does have, you know, his select few, but I think they're just so warped as he is. Yeah. But yeah, these folks you're talking about that are, wolves and sheep's clothing yeah. i mean they are more deceptive and maybe harder to well because if, see sometimes. if you look at a guy like Locke, his church isn't that big mm-hmm. um now he gets a lot of exposure <clears throat> because it's viral right yeah media um, social media yeah he's like the stephen a smith of uh, <laughs> christian is. takes yeah just always says yelling. ridiculousness doesn't really have intelligent things yeah. to say but always gets put online yeah. for some reason <laughs> let me tell you but then the other guys that we're kind of thinking, like their follower, their their following is massive, massive, right. and you know people just hang on every word that's being said, and so both ends. Well, those are, people sometimes are indistinguishable. Like what what they, what they say is indistinguishable from just like you know new age, you know hippie guru, you know cult leader type people that just say nice things, yeah. and then you know. A lot of times those people are like secretly using that to get people to come in so they can actually do harmful stuff to them. But, um, but at the same thing, at the same time, like there, there's, there's no distinguish, distinguishable or discernible difference between what they're saying and what, you know, scripture says. And what God's yeah. Saying. Yeah. Like, and, you know, and so well, you're just saying nice fuzzies. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. And it sounds true. Yeah. It sounds good. Um, but when you really either listen to the context of the whole message, or maybe not even just that message, but what that 
what has been taught and the whole direction of a conversation. That's weird. Yeah, I think Uh-oh. the camera man went to sleep. One of our cameras died. Uh oh. I wonder if the battery died. Well, we got these still going. <laughs> if you're if you're listening, um, it, it doesn't matter. just know that the yeah the a camera died, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're still oh, here. A terrible shot. So I right? charged as long the battery, as the other two. And that one, but I meant to plug it in. <laughs> so live and learn. Some beautiful uh, bars. Yep. Yeah, live and learn. We just may not use that camera again. Okay. So um, no worries. We use part one, of it. This one right here is not too bad. Yeah. So we have that camera. That's I. We have that camera. And then the one that died. So yeah, we can use it. We can swap in between. And I don't look really old. <laughs> 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 Who is that old guy? <laughs> so my wife has actually ordered me this ointment to put in up here to help my hair thicken and go down. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it from China? I don't know. Yeah. It most likely came from Amazon. Yeah. So, China so song nice. is what we how, call it. How, how old are you? 44. 44. Okay, I'm not as so old as I'm, Jeff, but Jeff looks younger than me. I'm 11 years younger than you. You don't have gray. Maybe a little and, down. Yeah, I've got I'm, some on I'm side. using stuff in my hair like that too, so don't worry. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you have a little more. Did your dad lose? No. Or your granddad? No. It, it's your on your mom, mother's your side. side. Yeah. My yeah. uncle did. Your mom? She's not bald. I don't know. I can't think of anybody on my mom's side. Is your mom really bald? Mom. She listens. She can listen. No, she's not bald. <laughs> but we both have very, very thin hair, uh, yeah. which I think is a contributing factor. Come. Um, well, let me know if it works because I'll I've, I've got some thin in the back. back so yeah, so listen. Yeah. So you guys are listening to the middle aged podcast. Now we're <laughs> deconstructing our hair. <laughs> our hair's deconstructing. Well, I, I started not going, by choice. I did start going gray when I was sixteen, though. So it started happening early for yeah. me. Hey, and the glasses <laughs> I'm wearing are progressive lenses. Oh, proud to say. Oh, nice. So uh, they're bifocals. You just don't see them on. I like it. Yeah. It's very progressive I'm, of you. Benjamin Franklin would just. He'd be Die so of that. He'd be. Yeah. Well, I, I'm at the point now where if I'm wearing contacts, I have to have readers in or even closer to the face. Like I just have to. I can't. It's it's blurry. In this photo. So I, I got these like a week and a half ago, and I've pretty much just worn glasses because I don't have to keep doing a reading. Yeah. Mm, yep. I've also got this weird growth. <laughs> <laughs> um. Don't show it in that camera angle, but we, we have deconstructed our topic. Yeah, we've, we have deconstructed way far away. I don't even remember from... where we were in that, but um, oh, we're well, talking about some of the false teachers out there, but just yeah. the two ends of this and how that can lead to this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And 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 it's you know I, I think we were going to talk about the role within the church, like what can we do yeah, and, and get to that. But I think that's that's where we've seen a lot of this too is when people recognize. That and I, and I think, you know, personal stories that I've known of individuals who've deconstructed and gotten away from the faith. You know, they they've been hurt by, like, say, pastors or leaders within the church who maybe seem like well-meaning individuals, and maybe were at one point. Um, you know, if we're not careful, any of us can get away from Scripture and begin to make it all about us and idolize the wrong things and. But, um, you know, these individuals have experience with these pastors or these leaders and, and they see the hypocrisy or they see the, the harmful things that they're doing. And it's such a turnoff. And, uh, you know, in some instances, it's straight out abuse, which is wrong and evil and terrible. But in some instances, it's just, you know, seeing hypocrisy at its worst and uh, unfortunately, that leads people to deconstruct because they're like, well, how in the world? It, it becomes more of they're not deconstructing because they're really wrestling with, um, I don't believe this is all true, but it's like, you know, if that is what Christianity represents, then I'm not even going to like spend the time in necessarily deconstructing everything. I'm just going to start to turn away and tell you why now with my presuppositions, why I believe that that is wrong. Like scripture is wrong. All of this is wrong. And uh, I, I've seen that too many times and it, it's sad. Um, you know, I, I I would be broken hearted to know, and I'm sure it happens to all of us who are in leadership. You know, we've said something that's turned somebody away or we've 
done the wrong thing in the wrong moment that maybe has led someone to think otherwise. But, um, you know, if my life were continually marked by leading people ultimately to be turned off by the faith, then, um, you know, I, probably don't have Jesus. At that. Yeah. I mean, I, I would feel, I mean, cause if, if my life is supposed to be, you know, as any Christian, not just a, a minister, it's supposed to be about leading people to Jesus and I'm doing the opposite. You know, it, it makes you think, does that person even have Jesus to begin with? Cause they're not leading anybody to him. So they don't even know where he is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we saw that with, and I don't know if you've read up on his story any, and it's been a while since I've read it, but there's a worship leader at a camp that we used to go to in Texas. Dude was on fire for Jesus. Was it, was it that big, huge uh, gathering that was kind of north Texas? Um, it, it was in North Texas, uh, Wichita Falls area, Iowa City, or Iowa Park. But 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 there was a pastor up there who had a big ministry and put on this camp and um, he he was a great communicator. Um, actually, the last time I heard him communicate, he started to say some things that I thought mm, I don't know if I would take my students back here. And actually, I was planning on the last year I was there. I was not planning on taking you guys there. Um, I, I think you guys ended up going anyway. But yeah. um, that was after I had left. But I I was actively planning no. Uh, you know, that I, I don't know if I trust this guy anymore just because of some of the things he was saying. But long story short, his worship leader was a guy that he had sort of taken in and, uh, you know, really mentored. And uh, the worship leader ended up seeing this guy's hypocrisy and some of the evil that he was doing and um, completely deconstructed and got away from his faith. Yeah. And, and it was, it was felt hard. It, it, it was really, really sad. I mean, it broke my heart to see it, but there's stories like that everywhere. And uh, it just goes to show you that, you know, and I'm not pointing the blame on anyone, but trying to look in the mirror, constantly evaluate, wow, is my life pointing to Jesus? And where is it not pointing to Jesus? And if it's not, I need to be you know, very careful with that and how I do things where it, it appears that it's not. And then maybe even go back and apologize to people that I know, you know, what, I've, I've probably wronged them by not showing them love or not caring for them and, and not, uh, you know, looking out for my interest over their interests and, and so on. And in, the, in that same vein, I, I would encourage people if, if there's somebody, you know, listening or, um, tuning in that that is having thoughts of like you know oh this person that i looked up to you know they've done x y and z and i i you know that that's really co causing me to question what i believe and you know um they're start beginning this process of deconstruction i would encourage people to don't put your faith in people put yes. your faith in god because if you put your faith in people individuals they're gonna, they're always going to fail you we you give suck. you give anybody yeah. enough time, someone a person's going to fail you every time. But that's the beauty of God is that you know God doesn't fail us, and if you put your faith in Him, you'll see that. And I think I think Jesus, uh, Jesus is worth hurting. That, that's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where to go, Ryan? You got so <laughs> let's. I think it's a great place to to begin to, to wrap up. I I was listening, so a great resource. Um, Lady named Alyssa Childers. She was actually a part of Zoe Girl. I don't know if you all remember that band. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Late nineties, early two thousands. Thought about that band so long. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I think I might have got free CDs as a youth I, pastor. I think we did get Zoe some Girl. of their stuff. Um, yeah, you would get that uh, that box that would yep. come in the mail with all the uh, stuff that you just got it for the free music. I listen to so much terrible music with those boxes right next to. <laughs> Yanni live with your yeah, That's right. <laughs> I, well, comparatively, that might be better than some late 90s, early 2000s. It, it, it would give you like 10 <laughs> CDs, and there was maybe like one yeah, in there that was like, okay, decent. this is actually good music. <laughs> the rest of like, like, oh, oh, CD. What yeah. is this? Oh, but, there's uh, a Newsboys in here. <laughs> yeah. So we're not knocking Zoe Girl. Because yeah. I, so this Zoe lady, Girl was the one good one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Alyssa <laughs> Childers, she has a, a podcast, and it's all devoted to kind of like understanding 
deconstruction. And there's a lot of great um, videos on, on social. There was one I was listening to, and, and a guy, she was doing this interview, a guy that was on there was speaking about what you just said, Ryan, um, about you, you, you just don't look, you can't just look at the Jesus followers all the time. Like you have to kind of go to their leader, Jesus. But um, I mean, that was even Gandhi's issue. You know, he said, I, I love Jesus. I just don't like his followers, basically. Yeah. I love your Christ. I don't like his followers. But um, this guy said, if someone's saying that, a great question to ask is, well, what if you heard somebody um, playing uh, a Beethoven piece on piano and they were just butchering it? Would you blame Beethoven? Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't because what Beethoven... You would. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're completely ruining uh, the... Oh, <laughs> Beethoven. Why did you make this yeah, person yeah, hundreds of years after you died play this <laughs> poorly? <laughs> Probably from Arizona. But uh, um, you wouldn't. Right, you say, well, that guy messed it up. So why would you blame Christ for? Because if you go and you just read Scripture and you're looking at the life of Christ, and you don't see what, how a lot of us represent it. And um, so, yeah, if if there's somebody that's doing something within the church as a leader or just a representative of Jesus, I'm like that does not look right or sound right, or it was hurtful or whatever. Go go look at the Jesus of the Bible and. Use that as your point of reference mm-hmm. for whether or not this is something you want to be a part of. Uh, hopefully, though, hopefully what people see is less and less of Christians living in unbiblical ways and saying unbiblical things, and more of what we see are with Christians who might just mess up in life and then are loved and restored and brought back to health yeah. through the the... The community of Christ, because mm-hmm. that I that's what we want people who are questioning Christianity to see. It's like, yeah, we all mess up, but listen, we're here for you in that mess. Yeah, you know, we're all about we're all about helping you back into that freedom. Um, and, and I think we as a church can be, you know, not not only is it about us living obviously what we preach, but when we see those individuals that are wrestling and struggling with that, be patient with them. I don't think it's incumbent upon us to argue them back into the faith, to guilt trip them back into the faith. Uh, I mean, part of this is, you know, we're going to be passionate and be upset and, and be, and, you know, want them to know truth and want them to get back to that truth. But we have to realize that God is the one that has to do the change of heart, that it's, right. it's not going to be us running in and saying the one line that's going to like, Oh, okay. Oh, you're right, man. I'm, snapped out of it now god is going to do that part we just have to be uh somebody who's not going to be that stumbling block and maybe even light that match and and add to that fire we are going to be the ones who love them regardless be patient pray for them encourage them and then yeah be there to help give truth when it when those times present themselves or maybe when they ask and want to have conversation but I think we we often respond to it, sadly, the way that we respond to any sin, and that we just begin to get angry, prideful, and write it off. And that just becomes even more of a deterrent to them knowing the gospel. And I think we had a conversation over text, and I think you may have said it, Ryan, that, you know, obviously, I believe that these people who have turned away from the faith never really had the never faith had to it. begin with. Mm-hmm. And uh, they may have known some elements of the faith and maybe even been a part of it because of their parents or because it was the trend or because that was their friend group in high school or whatever. But they never truly believed or trusted in Christ alone. They may have trusted in, oh, I said some words, or I may have trusted in myself to do something or my church attendance or me being a good person or me reading the Bible or whatever, but they never really trusted in Jesus alone because I believe that once somebody trusts in Christ alone, um, you know, maybe, maybe this is a Calvinist part of me coming out that, that, you know, there's nothing that's going to keep you from resting in that grace and, uh, you know, continually experiencing. It doesn't mean you won't ever question anything, but, um, you know, there's there's not going to be a, a turning away from that because when you truly experience Jesus, you know, there's nothing yeah. better than this. Yeah. yeah. You, 
you don't want to give up what you have. Yeah. And yeah, there is that end, and I'm with you on that. I'm like a three and a quarter point Calvinist, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I don't know something like that. But um, you know, I believe that as well. Like, you know, people say once saved, always saved, or if saved, always saved. But I, I think it's more on the end of yeah. If you if you truly came to Jesus, knowing who He is and what He's about, then you don't leave that because. Yeah. Because you know what the truth is, and all the other stuff you see, all the bad examples, or all the false teachers, or all the hurt that you might experience in a church, like okay, they don't know Jesus, right? But I do. They don't, but I do. Changes your perspective. Yeah. So I would say if you're going through that, man, maybe you just never experienced the truth of who Jesus is and what He can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I, you know, we seem to always hit topics in the way we do our podcast. You know, we don't necessarily do multiple episodes on one topic. So um, there's so much more I think we can talk about on this. There's a lot of great resources, a lot of other great podcasts out there that, that you can look into. We're already, we're just too distracted by the no. baseball game. There's a guy with a really sweet like Thor haircut up the bat right now for the Rangers. Jen- Jankowski, well, you know, you know, Jankowski. Thor would have been uh, He's what, Polish? Pol- yeah. So he's adjacent. Yeah, yeah. He, it was a was it was it a Polish god? Is that no, no? He's saying he is. Yeah, he's uh, Polish. No, Thor, Thor is a, a Nordic god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they're close. Yeah, they're close. <laughs> they're neighbors. They might yeah. be. That guy throw three balls. At <laughs> I saw wow. one of those earlier, and I was no like, wonder oh he my couldn't gosh. hit it. Man, that's not fair. I, is that allowed? Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, thanks so much for joining us, and um, good conversation. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear those. Um, And uh, who knows? Maybe we can do this again, even if there's not a World Series. Yeah. Game on. That's right. There won't be. There's football. Yeah. Well, Thursday nights. Thursday night football. This is Wednesday night. Yeah. Recorded early. So we could start giving commentary on Thursday night football. That would be awesome. Um, it's like tune in for the first half of Dude Facts. We just talk about <laughs> tonight's yeah. football game. And too bad it's not tomorrow. Cause that's and the, the I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't heard John Smoltz say one negative thing. About Hasn't the that Rangers. been great? Yeah. So, um, it's been on mute. <laughs> that's how I normally watch baseball, honestly. I, I was watching, I watched the game seven of the, the, um, a- ALS. ALCS. Whatever. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, ALCS. I was like, what's the acronym? Um, I, so I was in, I was in New Orleans last week, and I, I New was, Orleans. I was in my uh my hotel room, and I was like, I was like, I'm just gonna watch this. I don't want to hear anyone talk. <laughs> <laughs> so the question everybody now was wondering is, did you come back with AIDS? Uh, no. Somebody tried to hand me it's some. Too bad though. people really missed out. Yeah. <laughs> what about beignets? Oh, we did. So we uh, we actually yesterday ate the last. We bought a box of beignet mix Ooh. from Cafe Du Monde. Did you eat at Cafe Du Monde? We did. Yeah, we oh, bought. Yeah, okay. we got it there. I, had, I I I determined that Cafe Du Monde's version they 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 have a cafe au lait, and I'm like, this is just pot a pot of coffee that you poured hot milk into. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you didn't steam it, you didn't do nothing. I was like, this is this is not what I know. It's a cafe au lait. <laughs> I do like the coffee. You- it's good tasting coffee. Yeah. As, yes, it's very good. Um, when, when you went in, did you pronounce it Dumont? Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> Le Café Dumont? Yeah. Actually, oui. just like listen for people at other tables and corrected them as they were pronouncing it incorrectly. Café <laughs> Dumont? Café <laughs> Dumont? Can I get one of them? Ben. Ben. Can I get one of them bingots? B- big nuts? <laughs> <laughs> want some big nuts. <laughs> Because okay. I'm a deep back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to wrap up. Thanks for joining us. We love you all. Nothing like that. That's the way we play. Yeah, let's just close with that. <laughs> all right, we're out. <laughs>